In recent days, there's been a huge controversy in social media about attacks by Pierre Poliev, who is the leader of the uh, Canadian uh, Conservative Party of Canada and her, his Majesty's uh, leader of His Majesty's official opposition. And the attack is on the CBC and basically arguing that it's an arm of the Trudeau liberal government. And that and then Elon Musk and Twitter waded into this. And then the United Conservative Party in Alberta waded into the, it, it. It's become quite a story. So I'm going to talk to uh, Professor Stuart Prest, of, who's a political scientist at Simon Fraser University, to see if we can't sort all of this out. Uh, welcome to the interview, Stuart. Thanks for having me on. This is, let's start, at, uh, we'll get into the specifics here in a bit, but I want to talk about media de-legitimization campaigns. We saw this was a big issue in with Donald Trump when he started out in 2015, 2016, and, and intensified over the time, his time as, as president. Uh, we're now seeing it in Canada with the attack on, on, on CBC. I hearken back to what, and I know this isn't popular, where nobody's, the first person who says Nazi or Hitler loses the argument, right? But think we've got to the point where I think we can talk about Lugan Press, the lying press strategy of the Nazis. For, to me, this looks so much like that. Uh, would you agree or disagree? I think that it's absolutely the case. We see a, a strategy to try to delegitimize uh, certain media voices within what we often refer to as mainstream media by right of center politicians. And we've seen Trump do that. We've seen Polyev uh, more recently really take that on as a strategy. And likewise, we're seeing it in in, in Alberta with uh, uh, Premier Smith. I think I sometimes resist that that move to to draw the direct parallel with with German history just because it often invites a, a debate about just how close are we to that this or that particular chapter of German history we're we talking about 19th century communists are we talking about early 20th century fascists or somewhere in between uh I think uh focusing on that larger issue that this this is a very clearly calculated strategy and it's one that's been road tested and we've seen it work for some politicians at some points in time it doesn't always work but uh we we've seen this as a, as an attempt to really try to um not only not engage with the the representatives of the mainstream media and, and take their questions but actually to to go on to the attack and really try to to make the debate not about answering questions but about accusing the media of bias and, and working for for the opposition and really trying to to delegitimize any reporting that might come out of those those uh, outlets, even uh, even before the story is written. Now, uh, Frank Grace of Ecos Research published some data recently, and there's a a graph that we'll include in this video. Uh, basically, high information voters tend to get their their news from mainstream media like the CBC, and they get very little of their information from pseudo journalism pseudo news sites like rebel news and western standard online true north the epoch times all sorts of but on the low information voters it's flipped they tend they tend to get their information from the pseudo uh, news media and and are very suspicious of the mainstream media and the inference here uh, is that the attacks on cbc and mainstream media by poliev by the United Conservative Party is an attempt to grow that base of people who are suspicious. And what do you make of that argument? I think we've seen something like that before, likewise, in the, the U.S. Uh, 2016 election and then again in the 2020 election around Donald Trump, that uh, the preference for a uh, Trump and, and 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 sort of focusing on the the conversation in the the right of center media ecosystem was associated with with often lower center uh, information voters as well. So that's a again it's a pattern we we've seen elsewhere. So I think there's there's likely something to that and. It, it might be worth spending a moment just talking about the difference between these different kind of media organizations, because there's there's a difference between saying every, everyone has a bias, right? We are all uh, you know prisoners of our subjective experience and perspective, but but this the conversation doesn't end there. It's not that every uh, subjective pers perspective is is equally valid as a basis for a public debate. The reason why we uh, we 
tend to to in, encourage uh, voters to to look at information from from multiple sources and seek out those those what we can call reliable sources in in mainstream media is because they are institutionally designed to ensure uh, a a close adherence to to the facts in their reporting so all media organizations also have uh, opinion uh, uh, branches uh, as well so we have to distinguish between reporting and an opinion but but at these mainstream media branches, we have a uh, very close editorial oversight. We have uh, a series of uh, layers of, of scrutiny of anything before it is reported on. And an easy way to check, is this a reliable institution and to, to get your information from is do they do they admit mistakes? Do Will they offer corrections whenever someone says, well, your reporting is inaccurate here? And institutions in the mainstream uh, will do so. They will go out of their ways and often they will have really, really elaborate corrections when they, they see the, the need to do so. The New York Times is notorious for for corrections occasionally that end up being longer than the original piece because they really want to get the facts right and and so that's that's one of the things we look for in terms of what is a reliable source of information this is something i spend a lot of time talking with my students about in any class i teach nowadays and and so these these organizations that we talk about in that that alternate uh, uh, media ecosystem they they uh they have a bias but the 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 bias leads the the reporting in in uh, in most instances and uh, whether it's the choice of what what to report on or or how to to frame it that that bias is is front and center, and there's no real attempt to ensure an adherence to to a, a factual basis through corrections and so on. Uh, and, and so, it, so there, there are again gradations uh, between that. But but there is a real difference in kind between these different kinds of organizations. It's important to get information from multiple sources and from reliable sources. Uh, yeah, that leads to a, a discussion of, and I'll use the energy media as an example, and, and we're going to be discussing CBC in a moment. So this is a good time for me to, when you're, when you adhere to the Canadian Association of Journalists ethical guidelines, one of the things you do is you disclose conflicts of interest. So I'm happy to, to, to uh, disclose that uh, last year, the uh, CBC paid me 7,800, about $7,800. Uh, and I'm there, I'm a syndicated radio columnist for them. I do this regularly, uh, well, but once a month or so. And, and occasionally I'm interviewed about, about news stories. And uh, so that's, so all of the conflicts are, are on the table. And then on top of that, I want to uh, reference the Canadian Association of Journalists. Uh, to, they released two news releases uh, a few years ago, explaining why in their opinion, their, their view, the rebel media, Ezra Levant and the Re is Re rebel media, uh, are not journalists. They involve themselves in the story. They fundraise for, you know, to support legal opposition or, or legal cases on particular news stories. That there's a whole range of different reasons, but there is a set of ethics guidelines that that you can use to judge whether a, a news media is legitimate or is not legitimate. Uh, or biased or, or unbiased, and and I'd, anybody uh, who's watching this, you can you can Google CAG and Rebel Media, and you can read those for your for the for yourselves. And and I think that's something that's not appreciated. Is this is not some nebulous you know gray area where you can be you can be legitimate or not legitimate. There are accepted principles here uh, about which you know we can judge whether news media is legitimate or not. Absolutely. So I, I can join you in, in, in disclosing a conflict over the CBC. I, I uh, appear frequently on their on a, on a, uh, uh, a pro bono basis that I have been paid on occasion for for some some media appearances and the occasional op ed as well. I think it was about a thousand dollars last year. I'd have to check, but. Uh, but yeah, that 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 is one part of, of what we're looking for in terms of uh, uh, reliable uh, sources of of information. Where if there is a conflict, it, it is uh, disclosed, and 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 then readers, listeners can can uh, discern for themselves what is, what is the impact, if any, on on the information that that comes uh, as a result. Also. There is behind all this a, a a purpose, right? There's a different kind of purpose involved in the what what are these what are these enterprises for? It's 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 quite clear that uh, organizations like like Rebel Media and True North are, exist to try to advance a particular view of society. In some sense, they're uh, a bit like a like a. Uh, a 
a media equivalent of a, of a think tank might be one an analogy to draw where they're really trying to just push forward a a particular view of the world and they're trying to find all sorts of strategies to, to do that and and doing so uh in, in using uh, uh stunts media stunts and so on uh to to try to push the the the, the story forward to, to really try to be a driver of a story as opposed to a reporter on a story that is happening uh, and so it's a very different uh, kind of uh, of enterprise with a different purpose than a media organization that is dedicated to trying to to frame and and present stories in a way that helps viewers understand what is happening and doing so from from distinct perspectives so that uh, the viewers can can consider for themselves all the relevant uh, data that they need to to make an informed uh, judgment about what they're what they're witnessing so I think those those distinctions is not right versus left. It is it is a distinction between a, an adherence to a set of uh, of, uh, of principles of journalism in the service of one kind of purpose, or an adherence to a a sort of political ideological uh, goal and 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 a pursuit of a variety of strategies to try to support that. That's a, a crucial distinction here. Right. So this is good framing for us to talk about uh, uh, Pierre Polyev's attacks on CBC and his his successful attempt to get uh, Elon Musk and Twitter on his side. What can you tell us about that story? Well, it's, it is a, a, str a strange sort of thing, and yet it is a, something of the norm of, of life online these days where there's a story uh, online in the United States uh, um, a number of weeks back regarding the um, uh, decision by Twitter to label the NPR a, a it's it's largely donor funded uh, uh, media in in the U.S. as uh, I believe government funded, state funded one one phrase or other like that. And uh, and Pierre Polyev saw this. There was quite a bit of controversy around it in the U.S. because it is not primarily state funded. Uh, it is donor funded primarily. Uh, and and uh, and uh, Polyev suggested that uh, online on Twitter that that uh, Elon Musk make a similar designation of the CBC and. And it seems that that uh, Elon Musk heard this or read this and and agreed and 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 put a had Twitter put a label on on the CBC saying that it is a a, a government uh, government funded media and and there's a, when you go to the description of how Twitter defines this it is very broad and it implies that it could imply some sort of editorial uh, involvement by the government or not so that uh, uh, just leaving leaving questions that are, are are unanswered that are actually fairly easy to answer CBC editorially speaking is completely and independent of government that that's the start and the end of the story uh, and there are a variety of institutional measures in place to ensure that that remains the case but then none of that is is present in that that label that Twitter Twitter affixed and yet we so we have this, this specter of, of, of Pierre Polyev effectively engaging in, in a kind of lobby campaign to get a, a U.S. billionaire new owner of, of Twitter to to in, involve himself in the debate over the, the place of CBC in, in the Canadian political conversations. And, and and Elon Musk was only too happy to, to oblige. And so now we have have this this label applied to the CBC and the CBC in response has paused its its official activities on Twitter. I understand individual CBC reporters are, are still staying involved on Twitter. So it's not a, a, a total withdrawal from the site, but it, it's really uh, uh, trying to send a signal that this framing of CBC and its funding and, and its governance is 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 uh, misleading and and trying to push back. And so, but once again, it sets up that kind of structure of of uh, of Polyev versus another media organization. It's not a question of what is being reported; is it accurate reporting or not? It's it's a way to say to discount an entire media organization before a story is even written. And, well, that leads us to a conversation about what's going on in Alberta, because the United Conservative Party is echoing Polyev's uh, attacks on CBC, and in particular, Rob Anderson, who's a former Wild Rose MLA when uh, Danielle Smith led the Wild Rose Party 10 years ago, and is now her probably her closest advisor, and he was on Twitter today ferociously attacking CBC and echoing, you know, pointing to what uh, uh, Elon Musk has done in labeling uh, the CBC accounts. And, but it goes beyond that because now we've got squabbles uh, in Alberta about these sort of quasi news media organizations, Western Standard Online, uh, getting into conflict with the, the NDP party there. The, the, uh, uh, Rachel Notley, the leader, uh, yesterday refused to take questions from Western Standard uh, because one of their opinion writers had written, <laughs> really it was, everybody agrees, a, a homophobic attack on Janice Irwin, who's a well-known, well-liked MLA, but also gay. 
And so they they attacked her, and that was the, the basis for it. And then the so Kian Bexty, who was a former Rebel News uh, reporter, and very much in the same kind of uh, vein as those as Western Standard, was wasn't even allowed in the press conference. And so all now, you know, the, the UCP government people like Rob Anderson are rising to their defense, and and they're drawing an equivalence between CBC and other mainstream media and the Western Standard and Bexty. And what do you make of that? I think it's it's a difficult situation. Uh, and it is one of the the problems when when we start to introduce this kind of, of, of politicians versus the, the media f framing. And, and I think uh, uh, Rachel Notley and the NDP feel themselves uh, compelled to to respond using a, a similar kind of strategy here. I don't know if it's politically going to to work out in their favor. It, there is a danger here that it, it really tends to reinforce the the, that left versus right dynamic that that uh, uh, we have our media and they have their media and they're not talking to our media and we're not talking to their media and that that it's a it's it reinforces that kind of equivalency that 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 CNN style both sides matter uh, framing that I think uh, tends to to obscure the the realities here I think. Uh, there, there's absolutely a cause to respond to an opinion piece that that is uh, uh, homophobic and it is advancing those those kinds of attacks and to make it clear that that that, that is objectionable and it's not acceptable. But I don't know that that this strategy in the long term is going to to help the NDP with that that larger goal because you can you can uh, look at the Western Standard and say well what, to what extent are they engaging in reporting when they're in, in uh, undertaking uh, media reports and and make your judgment. On the basis of that, not because of there's an opinion piece that you didn't like. All news organizations will publish opinion pieces, and some of them are going to be objectionable. I think focusing rather on that those institutional mechanisms, making your determination around there, is this a reliable news outlet? Is it one that is dedicated to to trying to get the facts correct in in in, uh, in, in any kind of reporting that they do when they are trying to tell viewers, listeners what's going on? That's the key determination here. And if they have a problem with Western Standards reporting, I think they make their determination on that basis. Well, I actually can can contribute something useful to this debate because we, uh, uh, my wife Joanne and I, who is also a journalist, we've been in online news now. This is our fifteenth year, so we've we've seen this debate come and go a long time. And many people point to us and say, "Well, you're just another version of Western Standard Online or or Rebel Media." But here's the thing: uh, every business, every government, every event organized, and on and on accredits media. And the way you do it, invariably, is that you uh, you apply for media credentials. The person evaluating your application will then go and check your work. Uh, they'll check your website, in our, in our case, our podcast and our, our YouTube channel. And then they come back and, and they say yes or no. Now, you know, energy media is accredited all over the world. The International Energy Agency, the U.S. Energy Association, the Government of Canada. You know, we've never been turned down for accreditation because people look at our work and go, oh, OK, that's legitimate journalism. And rebel media, on the other hand, gets turned down all the time because, you know, people who are never heard of them before even will look at will look at their site and go, oh, no, that's not journalism. That's something else entirely. And I think it's entirely fair for uh, par political parties and governments to apply that standard to all all people who claim that they're journalists, and and they can and they can reject ac accreditation application, or they can grant it based on whatever criteria they use to determine what you know what is acceptable, and uh, that's their right. Uh, they and they absolutely should exercise it. So if the NDP or anybody says, "Here's a criteria. You don't meet it. You can't come into the press conference." I I support that. Uh, so that's our position. Uh, what's your, what's your take on all of that? The whole who is media, who isn't? Yeah, I think it's it's inevitable that there there's a line that's being drawn there. It's not a question of whether to draw the line. It's a question of how that line gets drawn and who draws it. And and I think. There is um, there is there is a potential danger if if government uh, or or 
politicians uh, become uh, too quick to, to draw that line, to exclude voices that can make a claim to being journalism. I mean, it's not the, there, 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 there's a variety of things that we can look at to, to mark what is and what is not a legitimate news outlet. If you're too quick to, to, to draw that line, or if you don't, if you're doing it on the basis, say, of a single uh, piece of piece of, of opinion writing, as opposed to the, that larger body of work, I think there's a danger that you invite in the opposition, you give the opposition the, the opportunity to do the same thing to, to other um other media outlets on, on, on flimsier basis. And so I think, I, I agree, it's inevitable that those lines are drawn and that there are organizations that are claiming to be a journalist that are engaged in something else, more like political advocacy uh, in the guise of journalism. And and that should be called what it is and, call, and called out for what it is. But but I think if, if at the same time where there is there is some claim to legitimate reporting that there should be an attempt to try to to keep those lines of communication open first of all to get your message out to a wider audience given that we have a very uh, segmented uh, uh, information universe out there, and and if if you're not talking to to media uh, organizations that that may lean in a different direction than you, then you you're not going to reach that audience. But but also because you you reinforce and say legitimize that 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 practice of line drawing and only talking to friendly news outlets, and I think that leads us further down a road that we really don't want to go. So I would encourage NDP to to be rigorous in their determinations and and really. Uh, 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 consistent in how they apply th those rules so that everyone understands when and when and how those lines are being drawn. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, uh, if a if a, an online independent uh, news organization can demonstrate through the quality of its work, a review of its work, that it is in fact adhering to Canadian Association of Journalism journalists uh, ethics guidelines that it it's interviewing quality uh, sources. I mean, there are a whole variety of of, uh, of criteria mm -hmm. upon which we could make those determination. And then, and then, I mean, this is where the NDP maybe should do a little bit a better job. Is say, here's why. It's not just you wrote an, an online ed editorial that we didn't like. It's here's another instance. Here's another instance, and you didn't meet our criteria. For being legitimate therefore we're not going to take questions or we're not going to allow you into our press conference that then we can have a debate around what is what is reasonable criteria and what isn't reasonable criteria and that's a legitimate debate and the conservatives will maybe feel differently than than the ndp and that's okay uh they'll have different criteria but this whole you know who 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 is a reporter and who is a journalist don't let government determine who's a journalist everybody's a journalist that kind of thing that that's where i draw the line i think that that governments and others have the right to accredit and draw a line so anyway that's and it's more than a right it's a necessity there that you can there has to be some sort of process to 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 structure those conversations with with, with media and so there there has to be some some process of, of accreditation simply to to create the basis for that that conversation between politicians and and then the media that they're speaking to and and, and so it's it's important to have that exactly that discussion you're having ha, you're you're talking about what are the criteria we're looking for because then we can we can evaluate the the kinds of decisions that politicians are making so when when uh, uh, Ms. Notley decides not to speak with the Western Standard we understand why she's making that determination and when when uh, uh, Pierre Polyev goes on a a Twitter campaign to try to see the CBC delegitimized by uh, by uh, with help with help from Elon Musk we can also evaluate why that that is being done and to what end and 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 I think that's that's a useful conversation to have it really helps us understand where these different politicians are coming from and the relationship they're trying to develop with with different for media outlets. Well, Stuart, thank you very much for trying to put some structure and, and rationale behind this, this the, the conversation we just had. Really appreciate that. That was my pleasure anytime. It's, it's important that we talk about these things, and I don't think we're going to be done anytime soon. <laughs>